This next topic is just to give you a little bit better understanding of what's happening under the hood. We're going to talk about the internal architecture of Spring Boot. And for those of you who've understood the history of web programming, some of this stuff will sound familiar because this is based on patterns and components that have been around for a long time that have then been adapted and enhanced to make them more modern and easier to work with and more scalable. So as you'll see, this is the, the general internal architecture. We're going to walk through the pieces one by one. And it's similar, though not identical, between the classic web MVC approach, which is synchronous, and the web flux approach, which is asynchronous. Um, like I said, the first half of the course, maybe the first third of the course, we'll talk about Spring Web MVC, and then the last half we'll talk about web flux. So internally, Spring Boot leverages something known as servlets. Servlets have been around for a really long time, going back to the very early days of Java. In the early days of Java, there were kind of two, two concepts that were really important, among others. Something called an applet, which is a piece of code that you could download from a server into your client, usually a browser, and you would get code running in your browser to do various kinds of interesting things. Or servlets, which were pieces of code that would run in the server, and they would handle web requests and do stuff in those days, typically serving web pages that were fairly static in their content, with maybe a little bit of dynamic integration of forms and other pieces of information. So servlets figure in, as part of the infrastructure. And then there's also a bunch of stuff that handles HTTP requests and responses. And you can learn more about this if you take a look at this link here. So a client, which could be a mobile device, or it could be a, uh, a browser, or a standalone client, or a command line, whatever, will send HTTP requests, get requests, post requests, and so on. We'll talk a bit more about that when you start taking a look at assignment 1A. You'll see that there's some get requests that you have to know how to formulate using higher level tools. And the client sends those requests. Let's focus on get requests just to make things easy at the moment. So a client sends a URL to the server. Embedded in that would be information about the request, if it's a get request, for example. And something called the dispatcher servlet receives that request and reads it in and puts it into an internal data structure. And then that dispatcher servlet will then start the rest of the wheels in motion to get the processing by the Java code that we would write to do the business logic. And what it does is it goes ahead and it forwards the now encapsulated HTTP request, the get request in this case, to something called a handler mapper or handler mapping component. And this handler mapping component keeps track of all the controllers that have been registered in that application process and then routes the incoming get request to that handler. And this is what is the handler logic, the controller logic you'll have to write for assignment 1A. And what it does is it transforms or converts from the world of HTTP into the world of Java. And that's what a controller does. So the handler dispatches, the, the handler mapping piece dispatches the HTTP request on the associated REST controller. REST is a, I think it's representational state transfer. It was actually invented or popularized by a, a grad student friend of mine um, named Roy Fielding at UC Irvine. Many, many years ago, he did his PhD dissertation on this concept. Very insightful, really forms the basis for the modern web in many ways. So the controller then will be dispatched. The, the appropriate handler endpoint method on the controller will be dispatched. And again, you'll see what you have to do. You have to write that code. You have to put little annotation like at get mapping. And you have to give the command name that's kind of part of the path of the HTTP request. And then there's typically some parameters and so on that come after that that get passed as parameters to the method. The controller is what is used to transform from the HTTP world into the Java world. And then usually what the controller does is it invokes a corresponding implementation method on something called a service. And again, that's exactly what you'll be doing here in assignment 1A. You don't have to have a service, but it makes life much more easy because once you decouple the controller from the service, the service is all just good old Java, whereas the controller is kind of this mishmash of HTTP and Java. 
So you want to get it out of that world as fast as possible into the Java world. And that's where the business logic goes. And you'll see that when you do assignment 1A. So the service will do the processing, and oftentimes it will work with a model. We, we do that a little bit, although our model for assignment 1A is very simple. It's just an in-memory database or data structure like a list or a map. And then after the service is done, whatever it's doing, it'll pass the response back to the controller. And that's just as simple as returning from the call. So there's nothing complicated there. Usually it'll come back as a return value from the method that was forwarded from the controller to the service. Once the service is done, it just returns, gives the result back to the controller. And then the controller takes the result, which is in Java, and converts it into the corresponding uh, HTTP mechanism. And then that's what gets sent back to the client as the response. And there's other things you can do. There's other stuff you can add, headers and other things if you need to. For our relatively simple assignment 1A, we won't have a lot of that stuff, so it'll look more or less like just a regular Java call. But we will be returning lists of things. In fact, for assignment 1A, we'll be returning lists of movie objects. And a movie object will contain a title of the movie, like Star Wars The Force Awakens. And it'll also contain a list of doubles, which are an encoding of the properties of the movie, like who's the director, something information about the cast, what language is it in, what genre is it in, and so on. And that information will be used later in the course to do basically what's known as cosine similarity index comparisons to rank whether movies are related to each other. And we're going to use that as the basis of a recommender system. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's where we're headed with this. But for the assignment 1A, we're just going to return the results. From the point of view of the service you're writing, it's just a list of movie objects, and each movie object has a string and a list of doubles. Under the hood, that stuff will be sent back to the client in some kind of JSON encoding. So you'll have an array of JSON encoded uh, fields that indicate the response. And this response is then sent back to the client, and the client does whatever the client does. In our, in our simple test program for assignment 1A, it just checks certain things, like did we get back the expected number of, of movie items? Were their contents what we expected? And so on and so forth. So it's just kind of some sanity checks. In this model, the client provides the view. So Spring Boot implements the model view controller pattern. You can read more about MVC or model view controller here. So the client provides the view. The view is typically what's used to visualize what's happening on your browser or your mobile app or your command line or whatever you're doing. And the server provides the controller, which is this thing that takes the requests in and delegates them to the, or forwards them to the service, as well as the model, which is usually mapping into persistent data, but doesn't have to. Now, in modern systems, and that's what we're focusing on, the server, this piece here in the middle, is often referred to as an API gateway to a whole range of back-end microservices. So the client just interacts with this piece here, and it's called the API gateway. Your, your first assignment, your assignment 1A, doesn't have an API gateway. It just talks directly to the microservice. But very quickly, we're going to step back and have an API gateway, and that's really cool. And then we'll start defining a bunch of microservices that run in the background. And so the client doesn't know about the microservices. The client only knows about the API gateway. And the API gateway is often written using some very clever discovery techniques, server-side discovery techniques or client-side discovery techniques, depending on your point of view, that will then take requests that come in and then forward them to the appropriate microservice or microservices to carry out the request. So a lot of what we're going to do in this class is to find a bunch of microservices. And then to make it even more interesting, we're going to apply a bunch of different concurrency and parallelism techniques things like various forms of structured concurrency or uh, parallel processing using reactive approaches and so on. So we can essentially um, do the processing here in parallel and get the results back and process them and do all kinds of clever things. So that'll be a lot of the focus in the course as well. Parallel microservices with Spring. So that's the end of the overview of Spring Boot's internal architecture.